Shaking me. Yeah, okay. Good. So, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. So, oh, okay, finally. Okay. Ah, okay, sorry for the technical difficulty. So, next time, uh, uh, I should have experience for this. Uh, so, I already the timing is early, but I didn't expect like any half an hour for this. So, uh, okay, because I told the, to told the guys, I guess it's the first lecture, I, I will repeat a little bit what we said last time. So anyway, we are talking about, uh, okay, we, we, okay, we talk about, uh, okay, wait a sec, maybe I, I should really, uh, give some logistic things, right? Uh, maybe like, uh, okay, I, I guess I'm online. So, uh, first of all, like, um, uh, Actually, for the toaster guy, really, so, um, that's the cost website. Uh, I think I finally have access to Canvas, so I probably can put a link on Canvas also, but just in case, like, um, that's basically, like, everything is on, on this website, more or less. Uh, everything I can imagine and put it on this website, except, like, uh, for, uh, for basically, uh, assignments, uh, submission, I probably will use Canvas. So for the rest of the stuff, information-wise, everything I put it here, and um, so that that's the main thing. Uh, so last time or like last couple times, we we talk about uh, so an overview of the course, and uh, so we basically so okay. Last time basically we we talk about uh, supervised learning. So uh, talk about regression and classification. So we we just start from here. So for Tosa guys, uh, you can always go back to the notes to see what we talk about actually. Besides, uh, besides that, but in general, it's like um, it's pretty high level. I don't think you guys miss anything. So, uh, I'll skip these rotation things. But um, so let's look at the um, problem again. So let's say we have a regression problem. What what do we mean by regression problem? Is uh. We, we have uh, a input and output. So we basically have an input x here. So let's see if I have a power point, uh, point here. I'm not sure if the closer guys can see me, but better use the mouse point. So I have the x here. So I, I have some data, uh, pairs of data. So I'm talking about supervised learning. So uh, for the training data, I have a uh, training input and also the training output. So I know what's the uh, expected output. So for regression problem, uh, the problem is continuous. So I, I have this yi will be some, belongs to some continuous domain here. So maybe I have some real number basically. So, and, uh, what I want is like, I want to minimize the loss, I have certain loss function that, uh, given the x. So the function is, this function f here is basically my regressor. So something I like to train this guy. So and um, this this f is kind of parameterized by this w. So uh, eventually, so this will give me the um what what is the current output that like given this w here. So we want to minimize this difference between this guy here and the expected output y i here. And this loss function, like for example, we can just use like a uh, a square loss here. So I mean square loss and. Um, and for example, like I guess we mentioned last time, so just give a very simple example. So let's say we want to uh, kind of um, predict uh, the mass of uh, a, a person and given some input is basically his height, uh, his BMI and also his age. So here we just assume we don't know what BMI is. So uh, of course, if we know BMI, what BMI uh, is defined, then given BMI and height, we can just compute the mass automatically. But here we assume we don't have any knowledge about this this definition. And and then like for example here, like I have height is like 1.8 meter, and uh, I have this BMI 23 and age 29, and we want to estimate the mass. So Let's say we'll just use uh, a linear regression algorithm. So what do we mean by linear regression is simply fit a line of the input and get the output. So we have the y. So I, I will just 
find some weight w such that like okay this x uh kind of dot border with this w here so here you see i just add a one here for convenience so in this case i can just wipe everything is into a, just a water border so an inner border like between x and w so so given that um we want to we want to just uh find this w basically so let's say we have some training data here. So I, I just simulate some training data. So let's say I have different some x here. So this is like the first person is like 1.68 uh, tall, and then like it's like 31.8 uh, is what uh, I guess is the BMI, and it's like 43.54. I don't know. That's the years old, and uh, the weight is like uh, 87. I think it's kilo here, and um, so I have uh, all these numbers here. Then I, I'm just trying to fit the curve, right? So given uh, this x train here, so oh, okay. One thing I like to uh, remind you guys that all my vectors is uh, column vectors uh, by default. So therefore, like my x train here is like a matrix. So I have this x one, the first column vectors. Uh, I mean first uh, input. Uh, features, I just put it as a vector and pad with like the second feature vectors and so on and form a matrix. And, uh, Y train here, I also can pad, uh, the, the weight, the actual, um, or the mass, uh, masses of all these guys here and put into a vector. So eventually I want to have something like that where I found to find W such that this multiplied by W will be approximately equal to Y train. And, um, Last time we said that, okay, we can do this using linear regression. I, I, I mean, uh, we can find W using, uh, uh, just minimizing this loss function using, uh, kind of some simple calculus. So basically like this multiplied by this guy here. Actually, uh, let me, let me just sit down and also, uh, let me calibrate my so I can write on this. Uh, wait a sec. Uh, Okay, now I can write everything. Yeah, nice. So maybe I use web here. So uh, here, like uh, we can just multiply this uh, these guys, right? So these are matrices, but um, you can just multiply like scalar. But you need to be careful, like because a matrix, uh, so therefore that like, it's not commute. I mean, the operation, for example, like these guys here. It's not equal to W multiplied by XT multiplied by YT. So in general. And then like, afterwards, okay, these guys, uh, if I take the gradient of these guys, um, by the way, do you guys know how to do the gradient for, for example, like, um, for, uh, W, A, W, let's see, I, actually there's a typo here. This probably should have a transpose here, otherwise it doesn't make sense. In, in terms of W. So, yeah. Yes. Okay. So, yes, so you per, per element wise, so first of all, like, this guy should be, what? It's a, it's a matrix? Or it's a scalar? Or it's a, what's the size of this thing? Um, yes, it's a, uh, yes, actually it has to be scalar. Uh, everything you talk about gradient of something, it has to be scalar because, uh, the, the gradient is defined on a, uh, scalar function. 
So if you look at this guy here, why is a scalar? You have a 1 by n multiplied by this n by n, something like that, multiplied by n by 1. Um, so, um, so this scalar function will depend on this w. If you think of w as a vector, so maybe I have w1 up to wn, let's say. So I, I, you can think of this function is equal to something like f w1 to wn. So I compute the gradient as you, you just mentioned earlier. So it will be like taking partial derivative, right? The, it, okay, the gradient of this guy will be a vector. And the i-th element will be something like that, right? wi, right? This is the i-th element. So the gradient of this guy should be something like partial f, partial w1, blah, 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 and partial f, partial w, and right? So, and what should be that value? Um, so I, I can write, rewrite this thing here. Actually, what I want to say is that if you look at the textbook or something, they will just suddenly come up with formula or like, but, uh, I, 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 uh, one thing I, I like to emphasize is like, uh, sometimes it's good, like you, you just go for this once, just take you five minutes and then you understand how this formula is, com is coming from. Then you don't really need to memorize it because it's, I, I can never memorize some stuff like that. It's much easier, like, so you, if you understand what's going on, it's very easy to. So these things here, uh, you can rewrite because this is just a matrix multiplication, right? This is really just equal to wi, um, okay, the ij element is, is, uh, okay, maybe I, I just write it out. So this one is actually w, I, A, I, J, W, J, uh, multiply, uh, uh, sorry, sum over I and J. Do you, uh, do you agree with that? So, in general, if you have a matrix A multiplied by B, the, um, I, J element, or like the, the N, M element, would be, uh, A, N, K, B, K, M sum over k, right? So, so, but here, like, so if I just look at one of this here, so let's say w, okay, I can write as w, uh, w i here, and this guy, oh, maybe I, sum over j here. So this part here, uh, is the, is basically the, uh, okay, I, I'm making it kind of uh, more complicated than necessary. I'm thinking, um, uh, maybe, uh, okay, maybe look at another. Besides this one, let's look at like let's say a times b times c, and I look at the n m elements there. So it should be therefore like from here would be like uh, a uh, n k. B, uh, K, uh, yes, K L and um, C L M, sum over um, K and L. So it's actually from here you just apply this choice because you are A times B times C, right? So you apply like A times B first, and then have one sum here, and then you. Apply a times b times c, then you have another sum. Therefore, you have two sum here, k and l. Uh, and for this guy here, I, I, this is look at the n and n elements, right? But you have w multiplied a times w is actually just one by one, right? So, and therefore, I actually can write this as w1i multiplied by aij multiplied by wj1, uh, something like that. But it's actually just one one vector right? W. So therefore W one I is actually just W I so I, I just so so therefore we just ignore these things here. So anyway, that that's what we have. Right? So W I J in any case. So this is what we have for this guy here. Now if I compute the uh this over Take the partial derivative with respect to, let's say, wk. So what I have is that uh, I have two sum here, right? So for the first sum, maybe I write, write as two sum. It's better to write as two sum here. 
some of a I, some of a J, let's say. So I within this sum that's that would be one element is like a K, right? So and within this sum over this J, that's one element is K also. That will be one K, one WK for this guy, and there will be one WK for this guy. So therefore like when when I really take for the rest of this uh, other other all the other terms basically will be zero, right? Because it won't depend on WK. So therefore like if I take partial derivative of these things here, uh there will be one term for this WI, so uh and for that term taking partial derivative of WK with us back to WK will be just a constant, it will be just equal to one. So and for that term like it's actually I therefore will be equal to K, right? So therefore I will have one A K J W J, right? Sum over J. And I will have another term also is like as I mentioned, like for this guy here I have one K here, J equal to K. And so I should have like sum over I W I A Okay, I'm wondering out of space. Uh I K oh, sorry uh, yeah that's better so I have A K J W J A uh, and this is like W I multiplied by A I K um so what's this guy this guy is just equal to A times W I this is actually um the kth element here um, of this guy, oh sorry, the kth element of this guy, so okay, it's okay, sorry. The kth element of this guy is equal to this way. So, therefore, like, maybe I write this k here. So, therefore, this thing here, I take a partial derivative of this thing here is equal to this element here is like the a w the cave element and this guy here is actually um also you look at that is actually i can write this as a transpose k i multiply w i so therefore like this is actually the k element of a transpose w So, um, therefore, the final result will be like, uh, the cave element of this partial derivative is equal to the cave element of A, W, uh, plus the cave element of A transpose W. So, therefore, like, uh, this is just equal to, therefore, like, the gradient, ah, I'm sorry, the gradient of this guy here is just equal to A plus A transpose W. Um, yeah, I'm sorry it's a little bit messy, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, actually I recorded this. I'm recording this. Maybe, uh, I'll put it on YouTube. Maybe the next time you see it, it will be like less, um, yeah. But, I, uh, actually, even easier if you go back home just write it yourself, you will find it actually very easy. So, uh, but, but, um, yeah, it's always easier, um, to, to do it yourself than like, listen to someone else to explain something like that but so therefore this guy actually take the gradient inside well x uh x transpose i i ignore this chain here plus uh x x transpose transpose times w something like that but of course i like, uh this transpose is just equal to itself so therefore you get you get like two x x transpose w so similarly, you will get something like this guy. You take if you take the um, if you do the uh, algebra again, you will get, get this one is uh, x. Take the gradient, we get x y, and this guy is x y also. And this is let's see. Oh yeah, this is just a constant and can be ignored. So so therefore, like you will have like two x y. Oh, there's a minus here, two, minus 2xy two plus uh, 2x x transpose. So I have these two cancel right here, so that's why I got this here. 
and uh, and then like we, we can just because like uh, we expect the uh, maximum like to have the minimum loss at like uh, the gradient is equal to zero then we set this to zero therefore we have a closed form solution uh, for w is just simply equal to this that's that's actually basically what, what um I, I didn't go for that last time but I, I it came to me like I guess it's better to just um, also um, mention this so anyway so uh and uh, if we use what we got like from this formula and uh, I as uh, I have this uh, simulated point like simulate the 30 training points here and I add a little bit noise there like for the mass I'm trying to estimate the weight and uh, I got like this weight here and as mentioned last time like this weight kind of makes sense because um, we expect that uh, the the mass of some fellow shouldn't depends on its age given the BMI and also the height so therefore like this this uh, coefficient is pretty small so last time we said like, okay it's not the mean square error is quite big yet we are not satisfied therefore like, let's try to reduce it and one way we can do it is uh, just um, <coughs> introduce more features so so we we have the original uh, three features are uh, the uh, BMI the height and also the age so now let's let's try to combine them so and uh, so we, we, we just multiply them to have more features then this way we will get like 10 features instead and we can do the same regression just consider these are the new uh, features so if we do the regression basically we can uh, decrease the mean square error to one point something okay it's nice we get much smaller uh, mean square error and we can continue to do that so and uh, now the uh, we have like consider the uh, what what do you call that uh, uh, the third order terms also uh, and then like in total there will be like 25 of them like total features and we can reduce to the point uh, 3.2 for the mean square error and we can continue to do that so if we go for fourth order there will be like four, uh, 70 uh, so many features and the mean square error will be like oh, we will be really really small basically so last time we stopped here so uh, uh, basically I asked like whether this makes sense or like is that the right approach to go so what, what do you guys say so is that um, so should we just keep increasing the features like um, so that um, yeah Wouldn't that also increase like processing time, processing time? Okay. Uh, it will uh, but besides that, like, what what can be some of the problem? Um, yes, uh, that that's the key word, uh, overfitting. So, um, uh, you you we only mentioned the training error here because like, uh, we we have the uh, we compute the training error, but if we try to uh, uh compute the test testing error, what I mean the testing error is like. Okay, I have this uh, 40 training points here. I try to fit the curve there. I increase the features. I fit the weights here. Now I want to see if my uh, my model at model actually generalize. So I just um, get some other data that the model didn't look at before, and I put in the input. I mean sub. Uh, I mean substitute this into the system there and generate the output and compare the expected training output and I can then I can compute the training error right so here is like what we got for the training error so um, if I increase the degree okay if I just consider first all the features I, I have mean square I like that and my uh, Testing a uh, training error is more um no so I mean it's like six point something testing error is uh, eight point something, and if I increase to the second order, I, it drop like both training error and testing error drop, but if I go to the third order, now the training error goes up, and actually it go way worse if we 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 look at like the fourth order, um, it's totally out of scale if you look at the period. this is like ten and this is like. 6,000. So, um, 
you have a very very small training error, but your testing error is horrible. So your model doesn't generalize. So um, it it worked really well for what is given to you, but it's kind of useless uh, for anything it doesn't um, see before. So and actually that that's important because uh, machine learning the main difference of machine learning from optimization is that like. For machine learning, you don't actually know the model. You don't actually have a precise function to optimize, right? You 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 have this approximate fun approximate function to optimize, because you have some training input, some uh, so, yeah training input, training output. You kind of hope that the training error is small, but you want to make sure that uh yeah, that is not your final goal. Also, like the final your final goal should be. You want to make sure that, like, okay, after you train this thing and you put it to the market, it actually work well. So, so therefore, like, um, the testing error is really the 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 thing you will try to minimize. But of course, you don't know what's the testing error, right? You can approximate the testing error, but um, so therefore, like, actually in practice, typically what is done is you have like, uh, if you have uh, a some data set given to you to train the model. You split into like uh, several pieces, so you will have a training data, and then you reserve something called validation data of like dev set, or development data, something like, and you have uh, final pieces like a testing uh, data. So for the testing data, you try to not to touch it at all. So for that part, you just use that. When you are completely done, you want to use that just to tell the customer, okay, your training error is that much. And you use the validation data to kind of like adjust your parameter. So you, you kind of train your, basically you train your model, but you probably your model have some uh, hyperparameter. For example, um, uh, one hyperparameter is, uh, is here, like how, how much, um, you should scale your um, basically like uh, how how much you should scale up your feature feature set like we described earlier. Should should you include just the quad quadratic combination or the third order or the fourth order? So you can use the validation set to see like which uh, I mean uh, where you should stop. So for example, in this particular example, you can see that okay, I should stop somewhere here. So probably we can we should just include the uh, uh, quadratic features, and then afterward you report the your error to your customer. You you shouldn't use this because like um, you kind of co-opt your result here by including uh, um um oh it's hard to explain but okay it's in any way I I am not very articulate here but you are simply co-opting your data here so. Of course, like, what I want to say also, like, many times if you look at paper, especially earlier research papers, many people cheating, so they don't really kind of split into like really three sets, and they only have this training and testing, and they use the testing to kind of adjust the hyperparameter also, and then they report this, uh, as the final result, and it's actually biased. Uh, you, you're kind of like, had a lot here, kind of like dial, you tune everything, and and you you kind of co-op your data. So, but okay. So, if you want to cheat a little bit, you can do that. But uh, it's not preferable, especially if you go for a real competition, because uh, you find that you um uh they they know you cheat, and uh you won't get good result from that. Uh, so, for example, you go for competition at like KRO and you definitely uh, want to preserve some data for you for, I mean, for final testing or something like that. So anyway, uh, that's the lesson learned here. And uh, for some um, kind of intuition here, why, why is it so bad when we uh, increase uh, the, uh, I mean, scale up the feature? Um, that what he mentioned earlier is the overfitting. So, um, as you can see, like for example, you think of a very simple, uh, curve fitting problem. So I have some data set, data point here. I just want to fit my 
data point with some um, approximate curve here. So I can just uh, use a linear model, then I will fit uh, by this blue line here. Uh, but I can go for quadratic, so I will have this uh, wet curve here. And we can go more. So let's see, this is like, uh, um, what, estimated curve, original curve. Oh, okay, okay. The original curve, I'm sorry, the original curve is, uh, I, I, actually I start with some, uh, uh simulated result here also. I, I started with like original curve. Then I sample on this curve and add some noise here. So ideally, like, I want to estimate, uh, something like close to this curve. So this is the linear model. As I mentioned earlier, the estimated curve is like that. So if I go for second order, I have something like that. I can go third order, fourth order, and so on. But if I go higher and higher, it will try to, um, you will have a curve try to fit all the points. And, uh, it sometimes is not so desirable because this point, uh, is noisy itself. Most of your real data are noisy. So if I go, keep on going, so you will see like it become very bad. They were just trying to go for all these noisy point, but the end result is like it, it will be, um, yeah, kind of overfit. So that, that's uh, some, uh, intuition why it doesn't work well. And, uh, and also this, um, uh, actually, um, one, a uh, buzzword or like one, uh, jargon for this thing is I like call a bias and variance, uh, trade off. So, um, let's see, I don't have here. Okay. I have here, I think. Um, So, okay, maybe I, I go through this slides first. It's basically just a summary. So, um, the key is that if you have a complex enough model, you can learn anything, right? So, the problem is that you will learn the noise also. So, if you have complex enough model, you can learn anything, but then you will learn the noise. And as mentioned earlier, machine learning is all about generalization. You want to generalize. You want to make sure your model is able to generalize. So, again, the key will be the testing error, not the training error. And, uh, so, and I mentioned earlier, machine learning is very similar to optimization, but unlike optimization, you don't have the uh, true objective function there. You only have the approximate objective function. So, um, you should avoid overfitting or underfitting. Overfitting is what we saw earlier. So underfitting will be like, like, like this one here, you, the data is approximately, I mean, uh, apparently it's quadratic, but you try to fit a linear curve. So the model is basically it's not complex enough. So um, so it's kind of that that that's what what we call uh, known as underfitting. And uh, there's some poor word for that. Like uh, everything should make as simple as possible, but not simpler. And I don't think it's from Albert Einstein. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Um, um, yeah. Anyway. Um, I'm also overly complex model is not good. Yeah. And, uh, okay, uh, here is like some, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, some jargon for there is a high bias, high variance. So, uh, sometimes like, be, be, besides you heard of like overfitting, underfitting, some people also refer this as high bias and high variance, uh, especially for people from statistics. Um, so, uh, the way I try to memorize it is like, when you call high bias, it, it means like that fellow is too rigid. Like he cannot learn anything, basically. So therefore, like it, it's apparently underfitting. The model is not complex enough. So it's, it's very much biased. So high variance would be like he's too elastic. He, he doesn't have any stand. So <laughs> he, whatever he say, he trusts everything you say. So that would be very bad also. So and that, that would be high variance. Um, and let's see. Uh, uh, okay, what, what I'm doing with time actually. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, actually, we've already mentioned that, like, for high variance domain, we're just learning noise, learning data noise, therefore, it's not good. 
And so therefore, the model complexity is, is relative. It's actually relative to your what uh, the amount of data you uh, that uh, are available. So if you have more data, then it used to be overfit. It may, may not be overfit anymore. So that's exact. Actually, precisely why uh, neural network is so powerful because um, it just can create a very very complex model that can be train can be trainable basically. And given that like, we have lots of lots of data nowadays, um, the problem of overfitting become uh, less a concern. Uh, at least for many problems, for example, like for computer vision and for maybe language, uh, uh, natural language processing, because like, it's very easy to get data. But, like we speak every day, so you have lots of lots of data, and you you have all these re cameras, like more cameras than human being, and you have like uh, what I, I remember, like every eight. Uh, I think it's like the, I, I heard a stat from also like uh, CS two forty one and like every three seconds that like, you have like eight more hours of uh, videos uploaded to YouTube, something like that. So you at least in terms of this kind of problems, uh, data is never a problem. Although, like, I need to give a caveat that, uh, label data is expensive. So we will see, like, how we can, um, solve, not, at least mitigate some of this problem. And, uh, of course, like, for some other domain, for example, medical, uh, image processing, it may be, uh, a little bit harder, uh, because, um, there's privacy concern, like, you typically you cannot get as much data, and so, but, uh, at least for many problems, I, uh, now, um, really, like, data is not an issue anymore. And, uh, one thing I'd like to ma also mention is, like, an idea of regularization. So, uh, and, so even though, uh, even when, like, you don't have, uh, so much data, you, you have, uh, let's say, uh, only that much data, not a lot, not big data, but, like, medium amount of data, um, it's often like, uh, better rather than using a simple model, you want to use a more complex model, then kind of scale it back a little bit. So you have models have a larger capacity, so you have more parameters to tune, but you just add some constraint, some additional constraint, such that the parameters doesn't go really wild. And, uh, this uh, process is typically known as regularization. And, uh, uh, we, we can, we will see more like example for regularization, but at this, uh, at this point now, um, you can just think of this technique such that like it doesn't let the parameters go as crazy. Um, one, let's see if I have example. Okay, actually I have an example here. For example, like, uh, um, a classic, uh, technique is known as, uh, which regression. So, Basically, it's uh, very much similar to what we have earlier. So again, like we, we do a linear regression, so and we try to minimize the mean square loss here. So and this is the mean square loss way. But we also added one additional uh, kind of term for the loss function. So we add added like something like a square term for the weight. So what it does is like it will kind of make the weight smaller, right? Because Remember, like, we're trying to minimize this loss function, right? If we add this guy, we want to, this will kind of, like, discourage the weight to be, like, too big. So if this basically just compute, okay, this is just, uh, we have W, this, okay, this is W transfer, right? Now multiply by W, it's just, like, basically a dot product of, of, uh, W, and, and it's the square of all, Sum of square of the all the uh, weight parameters, and uh, the nice thing is that for which regression we can easily uh, rewrite the whole things uh, as as before. Like we can just absorb this lambda to one of these terms here. So if you remember this, I can expand to this, and this absor uh, absorb into this here. And if trying to find uh, again, I set the gradient equal to zero. We'll be just setting this guy equal to zero and we'll be uh just instead of having like 
W equal to x, x transpose x multiplied y, I have an additional term here. Uh, okay, I forgot this inverse, of course. x, x transpose inverse x, but now I have this number i here. And uh, this is which regression. Um, another common example is lasso. So, um, which regression we, we have, uh, we add basically the so-called like L2 norm of the weight parameters here. So, instead of using this L2 norm, so, um, uh, the square norm. So, uh, do you guys like, uh, know what I mean by norm here? Uh, norm. So it's like measure the um cup um the size of a vector basically. So uh L2 norm will be the, the Euclidean. So you are just summing like what we have earlier this year. Sometimes we can write it as W two. It's just summing like W one squared. I mean summing the square of each of these elements, right? To W N square, let's say. And for the W, uh, for the L1 norm will be summing the, uh, absolute value of all this element of W. So L1 norm sometimes is more preferable, uh, because, uh, uh, this go for the, uh, I don't know, this is related to the, uh, area known as comparisoning. Uh, I don't, I don't know how many of you heard of that. It was popular like five, ten years ago. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, like, uh, um, really popular 10 years ago. So, uh, the story is like, uh, oh, of course, like, the technique itself is old, like in the 90s, uh, even earlier than that. But, uh, the story is, uh, they have a sexy story for that. So they, they said this, uh, I guess like, a bunch of, uh, researchers are from WISE and they really know how to market the things. They have that before, but then they, they, put in a very sexy name called like compressed sensing and saying like okay you have this single pixel camera so um so the uh the killer app is saying like okay you have this camera uh, uh normal camera is cheap but you have this infrared camera uh, so no i yeah infrared or ultraviolet camera uh, i forgot like which bandwidth the sensor is expensive so what they want to do is like, instead of you have like high resolution and many, many sensors, you just use one sensor, but uh, you can't uh, modulate that. So you have one sensor, you modulate over time. So you, you when the light's coming in, you have a modulated pattern and project it into one sensor and you uh, compute it over one, uh, some period of time and you go for some single processing that the single processing is this compact sensing thing. And, uh, and, and, um, yeah, and that's the story. But it did, but, uh, I, I think the, the, the end result is like, uh, uh, the thing to mix this light, that chip here is really important, like really, uh, expensive also. Therefore, they didn't say the cash here. So the sensor is expensive, but this guy is even more expensive. At least at that time. So I don't know. What now? But anyway, so uh, anyway, I don't see any this kind of single sensor camera. So I guess like the field is still there. But uh, after a while, like especially for the single processing guy, they just have new toys every several years, and they have this uh compressed sensing is really sexy for like five years, and then it just kind of yeah. Well, yeah, anyone talk about that? But anyway. So the, the catch there is basically like you have this W, if you have this L1 thing here, uh, it will kind of, instead of this L2, this L1 tends to make the weight, um, not just more, it will force like the vectors to have lots of seals. One, one thing, uh, you can, um, one intuition will be like, you have this L, L1 norm, I have L2 norm, right? We can also introduce L0 norm. So what, what the, what do we, what do I mean by L0 norm? It will be like, uh, if I, okay, 0, right? So I have this one norm will be like W1, 
to the power one, right? Plus w two to the power one, and so on, right? So if I seal norm, then it will be something like w one to the power zero plus w two to the power zero, and so on, right? But um, something to the power zero, it will be always one, right? When this thing is non-zero, so but if this thing is zero, we'll assume it's zero. So therefore, like the W zero norm will be the zero norm is simply uh, counting like how many non-zero elements in the vector. So therefore, like if I apply a W, if I apply zero norm here instead of one norm, if I zero norm here, basically I will force uh, the output to have lots of lots of uh, zeros. So or like I want to have like very few non-zero elements for the weight. And because like one norm is in between like zero norms and two norms, this one norm have a similar effect of the zero norms. So therefore if I look for a solution for this, I also will have W more or less have uh only a few non-zero uh, non uh values, non-zero elements and for the rest will be mostly zero. And uh and, and and that will be like some uses for this kind of application. Sometimes you really want the weight to be like most of the time on seals. One possibility is uh, after that, maybe you can save lots of com uh, uh, computations, right? Because you only train once. After you train them, you have this W, uh, w weight here. If most of the parameters, uh, most of the elements are uh, seals, then you don't need to compute it, right? So therefore, like... Uh, one possibility is that it will just uh, save lots of computations. And by the way, like all this which uh, uh, regression and also lasso, they they uh, you can use. They are available in Python and through this scikit-learn library. Um, and but uh, I prepared this slides last year, so I at that time I used this version zero point one eight point one, and it looks like there's some. Uh, some bugs there, like both functions actually implement the same thing as implementing Lasso, but I, I didn't check like whether they, they make uh, any uh, correction for the newer version. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see what else. Oh yeah, for for which unlike this which regression, like Lasso, I kind of write it uh, close form, but um, we can use optimization to compute this, and it's uh, it's relatively easy to compute this. So therefore, it's useful. As mentioned earlier, like uh, this will uh, enforce a sparse uh, solution. So sparse in the sense that many of the weights will be zeros. So therefore, like when they say complex sensing, more precisely, it should be sparse signal processing, and sometimes you. Heard that like that phrase also, and um, the, okay this okay this is some example like what we showed earlier. So if I have this uh, try to fit uh, curve for this web curve here, the original curve, I use lasso and also which regression for different lambda here. So um, lasso like appears to to be uh, to have better result than uh, which regression. And um, so, it, uh, let's see, nine, yeah, my degree is nine, yeah. Uh, yeah. So if I increase the lambda, um, then let's see, I forgot where's, what's the lambda for. Oh yeah, I need to be careful because this is not in scale. I increase the lambda. Um, actually, the regularization increase, but um, it doesn't look like so because like the all, all these figures are not uh, in the same scales. Um, okay, uh, a, a little bit conclusion, semi conclusion here. So uh, machine learning is all about generalization, and of course, this course is really about machine learning, and. Uh, of course, I, uh, or, uh, a more, uh, uh, yeah, even though, like, we will go a more precise technique, like, uh, 
new lateral or deep learning technique. Um, and, uh, okay, one thing I like, really like to mention is like, given compared, uh, reasonably complex model, like we can, if we have some training data, if we can increase the, uh, model capacity, we can always decrease the training error to whatever we want. So unless your model is not trainable. So actually this is, uh, sometimes it's useful because in practice, you can use it to debug whatever your, your, your model. Sometimes I, when my student is stuck, I always ask, ask, ask her, like, ask him, like, okay, just use less data, less training data, try to overfit your model. So if you cannot overfit, then probably there's some bug there. So what, what do I mean by overfit is like, if you decrease the number of data, you have the same model size, eventually you should have like zero training error, right? Because you, just like this curve here, you can, you can just like have this curve go for all this training point here. So, but if you have, your program have bugs, then you may not be able to like uh, overfit your model. So this is one way you can um, check whether your program is actually working correctly. Um, uh, but of course, like, at the end of the day, like, we only really care about the testing error. So, when you are sure that your algorithm is correct, or like your program is correct, then you always try to make sure that, like, your testing error is small. Uh, one way you can do, of course, you preserve a set of validation data, and then you just tune your parameters to make sure your validation error is small. Um, and we mentioned like bias and variance that jargon, like high bias is like just someone like can learn basically really rigid. And high variance is like someone is too flexible, doesn't have a stand. Um, Ocken racers, um, is a, is a kind of, I don't know. I, you guys heard of this? Like, uh, like there's something like a good explanation should be minimal. And, uh, for supervised learning, um, uh, both like classification, classification and regression, we eventually will just reduce into a optimization prob problem and to minimize a loss function. So no matter what kind of technique you are using, uh, SVM or like uh, live base or like neural network, eventually by the end of the day, you are doing the same thing. You just have some training data. If you're doing supervised learning, you just have some training data and try, just trying to minimize some loss function. And therefore, like, end up like you always just doing some optimization. But luckily, always we have all these packages to do, do optimization for you. You don't need to do optimization yourself. And, um, uh, we mentioned regularization. So it's a uh, term that, uh, we trying to kind of restrict your weights, your parameters a bit, like from running wild. So it's a technique to do that. And it's al almost, al it's always almost better to use more complex model and regularize that, uh, rather than using like a uh, simpler model. And, uh, and, and actually that, that's the reason why, uh, neural network is so powerful now. And, uh, and actually, uh, as mentioned, like, if you really have sufficient data, you don't really wor need to worry about overfitting. And actually, I, I, I put a link there, like, on, on the website also, like, uh, it's a nice talk by Andrew Ng, like, uh, I think it's like a, a year ago or something like that, uh, it's when he was still with Baidu, and he, he mentioned, he gave another talk about, like, this deep learning machine learning, he mentioned one thing, it's like, uh, people in the industry nowadays worry less, much less about overfitting than in the past, like maybe a decade ago or like five years ago, like because they always have many, many, many data. They they just okay, just trying to build like always the most complex model they they can afford by their computers or by their servers. Um, so anyway, um. Yeah, well, I, I mentioned this, like, sometimes it's, it's a good way, like, just to overfit a small training set that for testing your, uh, program, like, initially, like, just make sure, like, your model is correct. Uh, 
Okay, so um, I guess like what I'm doing with time. Any questions? Uh, oh, like I, I'm tired. I, I see you guys are tired also. Like I guess it's, uh, maybe, maybe I, I should stop here. I, I'll just entertain question and then uh, I more or less uh, start something else. Oh, okay, I, I forgot. Um, one thing, uh, I, I I guess I homework. Uh, I haven't put any homework yet, but I mentioned at the beginning of the class that we will borrow heavily uh, homework from like uh, the Stanford class at CS 241N, and uh, uh, you can I I will post that, but um, I I uh, uh, let's see. Ah, uh, yeah. So the first. Uh, Let's see if I can find, uh, if I have a tree. Oops. Uh, maybe I'll use this one. Uh, okay, I guess, uh, you, you can, to do this some work, like you can either uh, do this locally. You may want to set an anaconda, and uh, you can also like if you don't mind to pay, or or if you never use AWS or like Google Cloud before, then uh, another option is that you can set uh, AWS or Google Cloud also. I'll put a link there. Like you, you, I think like for both of them are uh, initially like. I'm not sure about AWS, honestly, but I think AWS have some um, some credits also, but I'm not sure for the um, expensive uh, machine uh, server. Probably they only have the most basic service free. Uh, I remember it's like free for one year, definitely, but uh, then uh, uh, if you are looking for GPU servers and so on, I think you need to pay for that. But Google Cloud, I think you have hundred dollar credits if you first uh, register for that, and uh, I am not sure how much is that to want the most uh, expensive server. But I would suggest that like, for this early homework, you just want it locally or something like that. When you need GPUs and so on, if you don't have a GPUs, then you can look for those options uh, because otherwise, maybe you you use up all these free credits very quickly. Um, uh, but Google Cloud, of course, you can just create many, many accounts, I assume. <laughs> you just, uh, make a fake account again and, uh, yeah. So, uh, but at the, the first homework will be, uh, I don't think you will need the GPUs and so on. So, I would suggest, like, uh, I'll post, like, just ask you to work on the simplest one. So, just to see, like, if you can, um, Set up the, because make sure you can set up things, I like get warning and so on. Um, and if you do it locally, and, uh, you can just install Anaconda, as I mentioned, uh, and, uh, and you, you, if you use Jupyter before, I actually have Jupyter here. Uh, I guess I shut it down. So I have Jupyter before, like, so you, you, um, I forgot if I show you Jupyter before. So, um, you, if you open that, it's something like this. So, and if you use Mathematica before, it's very similar to Mathematica. So it's some kind of low book. So it's pretty nice uh, for some, uh, some, some, it's not a nice IDE. You cannot write large program with that, but it's good for presentation and so on. And, and it's good for taking notes. So you can put codes here along with notes here. So your codes, you, you want it just, one thing you need to remember, just shift enter. So shift enter to one that part of code. And so, I, I, I shut down my server here, so therefore it's not connected. So locally, okay, actually I can even show you here. So I think I just, I don't know where is the, uh, uh, let's see, I think, I think but I'm not exactly. Sure. Ah, maybe I have a folder like that. 
yeah, assignment. No, I, have, I don't think it's here. Um, uh, maybe down low. Yeah, I see it. So, um, so you you see this i Python i i p y m b things, right? So it's like the Jupyter file. So if I want Jupyter notebook here, so I don't have GPU, so it say fail to launch GPU process. It's really nice. So if I GPU, it, it should automatically utilize that. So I have a browser open up. So I have this key and then I double click, I just single click it. And this open up. Uh, I, I would like you guys just try this first one. Um, so, uh, so it is about K Lewis labels. Uh, if you never heard of that, it's very simple kind of training algorithm, uh, for classification. So it's just that you have data set here, let's say some data coming in, and the data has labels, right? So you, so you have some data points, let's say, uh, let's say, think of high dimensional space, I have data here, a bunch of data. And one point is I call, is a cat, and this point is a dog, and something like that. I have each labels for that. And then I will, uh, if I need to classify the test, uh, classify something new data, I basically, I would just memorize all this training data, and I will look for now the new data whether it's closer closest to which one so if it's if closest to whatever the a pawn is referring to a cat then i will classify that guy as a cat as simple as that so this is the one newest label basically if i say k newest label what it does is just do a um majority vote so we look for the k newest labels of the da uh, training data uh, training data and see like I'm taking majority vote. Let's say if I have three newest labels, I have two out of three say it's a cat, so therefore it's a cat. That's, that's it. So it's very simple. So, uh, I will post it today probably, and, uh, uh I guess I will let you guys try this out. Um, so, so when you say post, you, you mean on your, on your website? Yeah, post it on my website with all these links here. Okay, to, okay. to get, get to the, yeah. To, okay, cool. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how much time you guys need. Maybe maybe next first day. Like try to uh, it uh, tentatively. If you guys all find that like it's, it's need more time, then maybe no. Okay. So yeah, that that's basically it. I guess yeah. Uh, graphics, uh, actually, the 1080 is okay. okay. You can go for just 1080, it's, it's nice, it's, it's kind of inexpensive. Like, oh, it's like years ago, it's, right yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's still expensive, but compared with those Titan X or something like that, even, yeah. or K80 is like, it's getting much cheaper. Like, it used to be like, a couple years ago, like, everyone just go for this, uh, Titan X, and it push up the price quite a bit, but then like the 1080s is actually like, mm, it's, 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 uh, uh, it's back up to 1300 because of all the crypto mining. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, that, that is one particular reason also. Yeah, I have a 1070 Ti, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, 1070 should be, should it should be, be good enough, cool. yeah. Better to have a large amount of memory, so how, how much memory do you have? Right? Yeah, it should be enough, I think. Yeah. yeah, but the crypto just like went down well, a lot. Been making me work a lot. So I was like, oh, you've done my overtime and buy a new computer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs>